Amen. 2 Samuel 21 and verse 15 through 22. Say amen. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again. The Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benob which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, succored him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear in him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel." And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sibachai the Hushashite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where El Hanan, the son of Jerry Oregim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, where was a man of great stature, stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David in the hand of his servants. The first part of the first verse that I read said the Philistines had yet war again. And you noticed, I think, throughout the reading of this text, that the word again plays a prominent role. He had war again. There was again a battle. There was again a battle. And there was yet a battle. Over and over and over again, the enemy came to fight against God's people. I want to preach with the help of God this morning, and I hope your help as well, on the subject, yet war again. Yet war again. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help me today to walk in the Spirit, fulfill what you've asked me to do this morning. God, I know that your word is anointed. I pray, God, that you help your vessel be anointed. And God, I pray that you would anoint ears to hear God, that you would accomplish your purpose in this place. God, we have been tremendously and wonderfully blessed by your presence already. And God, I pray that you would have your way. Let your word speak to our hearts, oh God. Let it speak mightily to somebody's spirit, Lord. In the name of Jesus, accomplish your purpose in this place and confirm your word with signs following. And God, we'll be sure to give you the praise and the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise and lift your voice in worship. <laughs> amen. Come on, let's praise him. I want you to let a praise come up out of you today. Lord, we worship and magnify your name. We praise your name. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Lord, we glorify you and we praise you. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You can be seated. Amen. I'm going to try to be like the Lord today and do a quick work. The Bible talks of ancient groups of people as giants. Genesis 6 and 4 begins with this phrase, there were giants in the earth in those days. It speaks of these giants as mighty men which were of old men of renown. Mighty warriors who, by virtue of their size, 
Not only did they offer intimidation, but an unusual strength. The word for giant in the Hebrew is the word nephil, which means a bully or tyrant. It is clear that the formulae, the formulators of the Hebrew language saw this particular group of people as tyrannical, bully, using their, their size and their strength to impose their will on those who were unable to defend themselves. The root word is the word Nepal, which means to cast down or to die, to divide, to kill, to fail, to cause, to fall. It means to overthrow or overwhelm, to make, to perish, to slay, to smite, to cast down. It is quite clear that when they were coming up with this language and they were trying to describe the effects of what these unusual people were able to do, that they were trying to communicate that this group of people were a dangerous and violent group of people. The Bible refers to this race of giants as the Nephilim. It means violent or to cause to fail. They're also called the Anakims because of, they were the sons of Anak. The word Anakim means to have a long neck. Obviously, they're trying to communicate the idea of size, of height. They are called the Amim, a warlike tribe of ancient Canaanites that the Bible said were great and many and tall. And then there is another name for them given by, I believe it was the Ammonites, they called them the Zemzuman, which means the noisy people. And it's something how those who think they have control and power always seem to be the ones making the most noise. They're these unusually tall people by virtue of their size became tyrants over smaller people. They were often recruited by armies to be mercenaries. The Bible called them champions, and the Philistines had recruited these sons of Anak, these, these giants, to go and make war with Israel. I had to, to laugh when I typed this in. Brother Mark Stumbo, our missionary in Russia, is about my height. And a couple of years ago, Brother Jeremy Lang uh, he went with, uh, with me to Russia to teach at the Bible college there. Brother Lang is about five foot six, and uh, he was standing between me and Brother, and Brother Stumbo, and he called us the sons of Anak. And, uh, and so these sons of Anak, these giants in the land, sometimes the enemy of God's people show up at uh, one at a time, when you face an enemy, sometimes when you read your Bible, it speaks about a certain enemy, and that battle is won, and that, end of, that enemy is never heard from again. They're like blips on a radar, small seasons of battle that are overcome and moved on from. But then at other times, you have these enemies that seem to occur over and over in the Bible. They are recurring foes to God's people. The Philistines are a group of people like this. They, they appear early in the Bible. As a matter of fact, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 21, is the first mention of these enemies. And they go on and on until the book of the prophet Zechariah, near the end of the Old Testament. This was a group of people that for centuries had been thorns in the side of Israel. They actually had been mentioned, the word Philistines or Philistine occur in the Bible 288 times. How would you like to have a book about your life and have the same enemy mentioned 288 times? That's quite a battle. They are known to history as the sea people, they were, they were apparently adept at boat building and, and sailing. They had finally been defeated by the ancient Egyptians. And when they were beaten out of Egypt, they crossed the Mediterranean and they landed in the la on the Mediterranean in the land of Palestine. And this migration brought them into direct contact with Israel, with God's people. 
when these two people groups came into contact with each other, it was a terrible adversary for Israel to fight. They, these, these uh, Philistines had learned uh, a, a different level of technology from the Egyptians. They had a technological advantage over Israel. Israel was still practicing Bronze Age metalwork. The Philistines had already advanced to Iron Age. And this advancement in technology gave the Philistines a tremendous advantage on the battlefield. Everybody okay? Archaeological discoveries have shown that the Philistines also seemed to have a penchant or a talent for performance art and entertainment. It would be the ancient equivalent to Hollywood's music and movies. The Philistines were warriors by nature. They loved battle. They loved fighting. They loved plundering their enemy. Their culture was built off of war and off of fighting. Their little boys were raised to, to love to fight with a bloodlust to dominate their enemy. They were aggressive by nature. Their goal was to advance their culture and civilization by any means necessary, either by death by destruction or by slavery, we will impose our will upon those who surround us. The Philistines would never be pleased with, with and satisfied with peaceful coexistence. For them, it was we will dominate or we'll die trying to dominate. This was a troublesome issue for Israel because they couldn't overcome the Philistines on the battlefield because they didn't have the technology, and they couldn't compete with the Philistines' propaganda because they weren't as adept in the field of entertainment. This translated to an onslaught of Philistine culture and entertainment and technology that seemed like Israel would be overwhelmed. Amen. I hope that you're making some parallels with me this morning because the world that we live in we're not going to compete with them technologically. And we're not going to compete with the culture and the entertainment from Hollywood. And if we're not careful, we'll feel like and think that the world has, that we have no chance to overcome the world in this day and age. But my friends, if you look simply from a natural perspective, Israel had no hope against the Philistines. They couldn't match their technology. They couldn't match their media. They couldn't match their culture. But, with, but this was not just a natural battle. This was not simply a natural matchup. There was a God element included in this situation. Amen. When you match it up from a human perspective, Israel was soon to be annihilated and disappear from history. But this struggle was not merely waged in the arena of humanity. Israel would be dictated to. If it was just a human endeavor, they would be dictated to by Philistine war, by Philistine weapons, and Philistine technology, and Philistine culture. But this was not just a natural situation. God had determined that Israel would survive against this bloodthirsty enemy. And God had made up his mind that my people will not be destroyed by the culture and the technology of their enemy. Amen. Amen. Very often when it would seem like all hope would be lost, God had stepped in, and right on time, God had sent, whether it was a Samson or David, God would send a champion to bring victory to his people. Israel is under tremendous pressure from the Philistines. Capitulate, give up, become like us, join our culture, act like us, talk like us, worship like us, live like us. It was the constant brash force of the mighty Philistine army and their culture that brought, bear, to, brought to bear the weight 
a pressure against God's people. Their entertainment industry was constantly making Israel feel like, hey, that life as a Philistine is awesome. Uh, the guidelines of Hebrew life, all of this worship and all of this going to the temple, it's too much. Uh, we ought to be like the Philistines. It was the constant bombarding uh, of Philistine entertainment and culture coupled with their armies to make Israel feel like we have no hope against this enemy. Amen. We might as well give in. We might as well give up. What's the point of trying to live for God? The Philistines are too much. They're too strong. They're too technologically advanced. Their culture is too deep. And we cannot win. It'd be easier just to run and give up and, and, and at least try to save our life than to try to live this way. But for most of Israel, that's exactly what the Bible said they did. They shrank from the challenge that was presented to them from Philistine culture. I hope you're listening to what I'm saying this morning. They became overwhelmed by the threat of the world and their enemy. And 1 Samuel 14 said that Israel ran and they hid themselves in holes and in caves. But may I tell you this morning that running from your enemy is not the answer. Amen. Becoming like the world is not the answer. Giving up your worship is not the answer. Becoming like this society and this culture is not the answer. You cannot overcome by running away. At some point, you must stand your ground, plant your feet, and say, God, I'm going to live for you, or I'm going to die trying, but I will not run anymore. You must fight to win. You hear me today. You must fight to win. You are in mortal combat against your enemy, my friend. You are in a combat, a battle against the devil and against hell, and you cannot afford to give in, not even relax for one moment. You must fight this war for you for your family, for your marriage, for your children, uh, for your soul. You must fight to win. Don't be intimidated by the enemy. Don't be intimidated by the technology. Don't be intimidated by the culture. Don't be intimidated by the weapons of your enemy. You have a God that is on your side, and that God has determined that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. That greater is he, I wish somebody would help me right now, greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. For we know the most famous battle. It's the stuff of legend. There's been business books written about the battle of David versus Goliath. For one of time, I'll not belabor that point and tell that story. I dealt with it in depth when I preached the, the Wednesday night of camp meeting. You can go back and watch it. It was July the 24th of 2020. You can watch that, uh, preferably not right now, but on your own time. But, but the first battle with Goliath, the Bible said in 1 Samuel 17 and 1, the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah at Ephes to Mim. Anybody who thinks you want to be a preacher, you go back and read some of these names and places, and if you can get through without cussing, you're called by God. They were gathered together at Shoko. The name Shoko, it means to be shut in or to be fenced in. The Bible said at Shoko 17 and 4, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. This loud mouth giant stepping out, amen, at Shoko. You don't think that Israel felt like they were fenced in by their enemies. You don't think that they were shut in. Have you ever felt like you were trapped by your enemy and by the situations in your life? That there's no hope 
There's no way. You look out across the valley and you are fenced in by a giant named Goliath. You can name your giant whatever you want to name it today. But there have been times in people's lives where they have felt trapped. Maybe it's trapped by a sin, trapped by an addiction, trapped by an enemy, trapped by something in your life that has you fenced in with no hope of escape. But it was at that moment when they were fenced in by their enemy that God raised up a shepherd boy by the name of David. And David left the sheep on the hillside and went to the battlefield. Amen. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every enemy was like the ones you fight one time and then they disappear forever and you never have to worry about it again? Wouldn't it be great? If every enemy you ever faced in your Christian life was just a one-time only battle, and when that was over, you could move on and just have joy and peace forever and never have to worry and never have to be stressed and never have to wake up during a Sunday morning service and say amen, wouldn't that be great? Have you ever felt like you were trapped in a situation and you're facing an enemy and that enemy just won't go away? And when you think you've got one battle won, there comes another. And when you think they've got that one won, there comes another. And Israel, when they watched David uh, as he triumphantly climbed uh, on top of Goliath and took Goliath's own sword uh, and severed his head from his body and lifted that head to show Israel the victory. Don't you think Israel thought we'll never have to face them again? We've overcome that giant. We've defeated that giant. We've killed that enemy. And now we're just going to go on and have joy. 2 Samuel 21 and 15, moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. Man, I thought, I thought I'd overcome it. I thought we were through it. I thought it was over. I thought we had overcome that enemy and, and, and now we were just going to have it easy for the rest of our time. But the Bible said, and David went down and his servants with him and fought that old enemy from all the one that they've been dealing with all the way since Genesis chapter number 21. And here we're going to fight again against the Philistines. And David waxed faint. You would have thought after Goliath went down that the Philistines would have given up. But giving up is not in the Philistines' nature. They had war yet again with Israel. The next verse, and Ishbibanab. I'll be honest with you, that's a fun word to say. Ishbibanab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, and he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. Ishbibanab means his dwelling is in Nob, a town on the northern slope of the Mount of Olives. It also means to take a captive. Nob was a holy city. It was a a place where the priests lived. It was a city. It was a place where David went when he was escaping from his his rebellious son. And he found hot bread in the temple. And the Bible said he worshipped the Lord there. David, the worshiper. David, the praiser. David, the one who's known for magnifying and praising God. The vast majority of the book of Psalms is David's songbook of praise to God. Amen. And it was at that place where David worshiped the Lord and got his hot bread from the priest that Ishbibanab decided, this is where I'm from. I come from this place. May I tell you, there will always be an enemy that wants to stop you from worshiping and getting fed in the house of God. There'll always be an Ishbibanab that wants to take your worship captive. Some of you fight this giant 
every time you come to the house of God. You want to worship. But Ish Bibanab tells you you look silly. Somebody's going to make fun of you. Somebody's going to laugh at you. Somebody might see you on the live feed and see you worshiping like that and talk about you. You want to touch God. But Ish Bibanab tells you that someone's going to tease you for it. You need the bread of God. You need the word of God. But Ish Bibanab tries to get you to quit responding to the spirit of the Lord. May I tell you there will always be a giant that tries to stop you from getting what you need in the presence of God. Amen. It's Bibanab made it his mission to stop David. I'm going to kill the worship. I'm going to kill the praiser. I'm going to kill the one that writes the psalms and sings the songs and praises God. Look, there's some people, they can come and go from the house of God and they never move. They never budge. They never say amen. They never clap their hands. They come, they sit, they go, and they, the devil never tries to fight their worship because he's got nothing to fight. But you find somebody that wants to be involved in worship and there'll be an ish bibanab that wants to stand and defy the praiser. Amen. Amen. There'll always be a giant that wants to stifle your worship. There'll always be a giant that wants to kill your Davidic anointing, your worship anointing. May I tell you that the greatest king ever Israel ever had was a worshiper. He's not known for his height like Saul. He's not known for his hair like, like, like Absalom, but he was a worshiper. And may I tell you that the devil doesn't care how big you are, how bad you are, how pretty you are, but if you'll be a worshiper, there'll be an Ishbibanab that wants to stop you from praising God. Hey, come on, somebody. Uh, you might have an Ishbibanab on you right now. You may have a giant saying, you don't respond to that preacher. Don't get into this service. Uh, don't get. He's trying to steal your bread and he's trying to steal your worship because he knows uh, that there's an anointing uh, on David uh, that will stay on worship uh, that will break the back of the enemy. There'll be a giant that always wants to stop your worship. Ishbibanab has made it his mission. I come from the place where David got his worship. I, got, I come from the place where David got his hot bread. And I'm going to stop anybody else from getting what they need. May I tell you, my friends, that worship is more than just spiritual calisthenics and emotionalism. Worship comes not from what we feel. Worship comes from what we know. Amen. Can I preach to you for a little bit? Can I just tell you that people that only worship by what they feel, they come, they shout around a little bit, and they're all loud, and they go, and you don't see them again, sometimes for weeks, months, or forever, because their worship was based on what they felt and not on what they know. But when you worship based on what you know, you can worship no matter what you're going through, because though the battle is hot, I serve a God that's able. Though the world is bad, I serve a God that's good. Though I may not feel good, my God is a healer. When you begin to make your worship based on what you know, he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I don't worship based on what I feel. I worship based on what I know because I've refused to let Ishbibanab stand and take my worship and my praise. I, I know I'm fighting a giant, but I'm not going to let that giant win today. Somebody needs to kick that giant out of your life this morning uh, that wants to stifle your worship and steal your bread. Make a joyful noise, Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. The way into his presence is through worship. The way into his presence is through praise. And that's why Ishbibanab wants to stop worship because he knows when you get into the presence of the Lord that all things are possible. Hey, but I'm not going to let that giant overcome me. Can I preach to you a minute? I'm going to try. Not, look, I, I got, I got uh, 
I've got it divided. I got it divided into two. I'm going to finish tonight. I'm not, I'm not trying to finish. I am trying to find a good stepping off point. But by this time when Ishbibanab has stepped out, David is not the young warrior that he once had been. He's not the chiseled specimen that he had been when he was young. He's not the same one that fought Goliath. He's not the same one from those days. Now David is a little bit older. Amen. He slowed down where he once had rock-hard muscles of youth. He now has softened with age. And he, he comes into the battle. And because David's a warrior, David's a fighter, if there's a fight, then I'm going to be in the fight. But now David uh, is older, and he's, he, he waxes faint, the Bible said. And ish thought, this is my chance to kill your worship. This is my chance to kill King David. Uh, this is the moment. Goliath couldn't do it, but I'm going to take care of your worship today. And David fact waxes faint. Uh, and here comes ish -Bibinab. And he draws back as if he's going to kill David. And just in that moment, they, they, they said, they, he said, here's what we can't do. We, we can't, Israel, they, they made up their mind from that day forward. David, you're not going back into the heat of battle anymore. Because if you die, the light goes out in Israel. Right? That's what it says. David, if you die, the light goes out. May I tell you, when your worship dies is when your light goes out. When you can come into the presence of God and not be moved to worship. And his goodness can't get you to clap your hands. Uh, and you can't get anything. Uh, you can't get a praise up out of you. Uh, that's when your light revelation has started to go out. You can tell when somebody has drifted further from God because their worship begins to get dim said, David, if you die, the light goes out. Look, you can't let your worship die. That's what I'm trying to tell you right now. You can't afford to let your worship die. It doesn't matter what you do. You got to keep your praise alive. If it ain't nothing but tapping your toe right now, if, you, if you're afraid somebody will laugh at you, if you're a little bit afraid somebody will make fun of you, if you're a little bit worried that a niche bibinob might see you, then just tap your toe a little bit or wiggle your little finger. But somehow you need to say, I'm not going to let my worship die. I can't let the light go out on my soul. I can't let the light go out on my spirit. I got to keep my praise alive. Friend, worship is more than emotion. Uh, it's, it's how God lights his church. Ishbibinab knows that. And so in verse number 17, but Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swearing him, saying, thou, thou shalt not go out to battle with us, that thou quench not the light of Israel. Abishai, everybody say Abishai. The son of Zeruiah, the, the word Abishai comes from a root word that means a gift or the father's gift. When it looked like worship was going to die at the hands of Ishbibinab, the father's gift stepped in and said, my praise is not going to die today. You're not going to put my light out, devil. You're not going to put out my light. You're not going to kill and extinguish my worship. When it looked like worship was going to die, the father's gift stepped in and said, not today, giant. You're not going to win the battle for my worship. May I tell somebody that God wants to give somebody the gift of worship today when it looked like your soul was going to die. My God, I wish I had somebody say amen right now. When it seemed like your praise was dead, when it looked like ish Bibinab had won the day and your worship was about to die, in stepped the gift of God and said, you're not killing, you're not putting my light out today. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Zeruiah, his father, it means it, it comes from a word that means it's a certain specific strain or, 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 or kind of a balsam tree. 
It was the, uh, the kind of tree where they got the word balm from. Uh, from this particular tree, the, the, the oils that came from that tree, that oil, that resin uh, was a balm. It was a salve. It was a medicine. Uh, if there was infection, uh, they would take that balm and they would cover, and, and that balm would kill the infection. Uh, it was used as a medicine. Uh, and the son, Abishai, the gift of God that is this medicine that comes. May I tell you that God, your worship, is a gift. It's a medicine for your soul. It's a salve for your spirit that when you're overwhelmed, you can lift your hand to heaven and begin to worship God. And in the midst of your darkness, you can find a balm for your soul, a salve, my God in heaven, a salve for your spirit. When you're overwhelmed by discouragement and doubt, I wish somebody would say amen right now. When you're overwhelmed by weakness and fatigue and you don't know how you're going to make it, somehow you find a way to worship. And maybe it's in the silence of your own bedroom. Or maybe it's while you're driving down the road in your car and you begin to sing words of praise to God. All of a sudden, that balm of the Spirit begins to move. God in heaven. Hey, I've come to tell you that there is a medicine for the soul. There's a balm. And when it feels like your worship is going to die, God sends his spirit. I wish somebody would praise him right now. I wish somebody would find a way. God, look, there's a medicine for the soul that's trying to move in here for somebody. Somebody's been dealing with a giant in their life and you're weary and you're tired and you're wondering how am I going to make it I'm going to tell you how you're going to make it don't let your worship die don't let your worship die don't let David be killed you got to let the bomb of the spirit come on your soul and revive your worship Jesus have mercy Jesus have mercy I think I can preach that in six minutes. Mm. The Bible said Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him. It means to protect him, to aid, to help, to support. Just when David was faint and weak and Ish Bibinab was about to finish him off, in the middle comes Abishai. And he stops the advance of that giant. Oh, God. May I tell some people here, you've been, you, you've been dealing with the same giants year after year, year after year, over and over and over again. Just when you think you've got victory, when, you thought, when, 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 when Goliath died and you thought it was over, and you'll never have to deal with them again, then there's an ish that comes up. May I tell somebody that you've had the same struggles over and over, that you may have to keep fighting these giants for a while, but every time you face one of them, if you'll keep yourself grounded and faithful in your worship, God will always make a way. He'll send a bomb, a salve at just the right time. Some of you have been hurt over and over by the giants of this world. Some of you have been, um, have been abused by the giants of this world. Some of you, you have had your worship attacked over and over to the point that maybe in the last few days you thought what's the point of even doing it what's the point of even going through it anymore and you feel like coming to church is almost hypocritical because you're just going through the motions and you're just kind of going through you clap because that's what we do you wave because that's what we do you stand because that's what we do but you've had this ish bibinab that's been fighting you and you almost feel like a hypocrite when you do worship because you know that there's this battle battle going on. May I tell you the devil is a liar and you're always worthy to worship. Amen. Not everybody's qualified to preach and not everybody's qualified to get up on the platform and not everybody's qualified to teach but my Bible said let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Everybody is qualified to worship. Everybody is qualified to praise God. Don't you let a giant 
Don't you let a giant from this world intimidate you out of getting your blessing this morning. Come on, there's a medicine for the soul in this place. I wish somebody I wish somebody hadn't let out a shout in a long time would open your mouth and say something loud enough that you can hear it. You're not going to kill my David. You're not going to kill my Davidic anointing. You're not going to kill my breakthrough. You're not going to kill my victory. You're not going to kill my breakthrough. You're not going to take my revival. No, 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 no. Because there's some, There's a God stepping in right now. There's a gift from God on somebody's. Well, my God, I would. Listen, everybody ought to wave your hand or do something. There's a move of the Holy Ghost here. God, let there be a restoring, a refreshing, a move of the spirit send the bomb send the salve of your my god oh god let somebody let somebody find medicine for their spirit right now no oh, come on i'm done stand and lift your hands to heaven even if you're not comfortable some of you it's been so long since you really worship that it makes you a bit uncomfortable to do it some you just don't know you've never really been around it so it has you just a little bit off comfort zone but i'm going to ask you just lift your hand right now all over this place amen all over this place even if you don't know why and the bible said i will lift up my hands in the sanctuary and i will bless the Lord. Do you realize? I don't know why God likes it. He didn't ask my permission. He didn't ask my opinion. But I know this, that when you lift your hands, it blesses God. Amen. I don't know why it blesses him, but it does. I don't know why he likes it, but he does. So God, before I ask you for another blessing, before I ask you to bless my finances, before I ask you to bless my children, before I ask you to bless my marriage, before I ask you to bless my body, before I ask you for anything, God, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer my Davidic anointing of praise to you because it blesses you. I will lift up my hands in the sanctuary and I will bless the Lord. Why don't you say, God, I know you'll bless me. I'm not worried about that, but I'm bringing my blessing to you now. I'm not going to focus on me. I'm not focusing on my need. I'm not going to let my giant, I'm not going to let Ish Bibinab get between me and you. I'm bringing my praise right now. Come on, you can do it all over this place, all over this place. You don't have to come to the front, but you can. But wherever you are, you ought to say, God, I'm not going to let that giant take my worship this morning. Always be in this beaming up trying to steal your praise. on all over this place. Lift your hands and begin to say words of praise. Somebody needs their praise to be rescued today. Oh, yes, Lord. That's right. Come on, lift your hands. Have the attitude, I'm going to bless you, God. I'm here for you right now. I'm here to worship you, God. I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care what I look like to anybody. People on the live feed, people watching can make fun of me if they want to. My friends can make fun of me. My family can make fun of me, but I'm not here for them. I'm here for you, God. I'm going to kill that giant. I'm going to kill that Ishbibinov that wants to slay my Davidic anointing and take my victory. Come on, come on, all over this place. You gotta focus. You gotta focus on your God right now.
Have you ever come to a point when you've been in church and you've been struggling and going through something? And in your mind, you wish, I wish somebody just come over and pray with me. I wish somebody just lay their hand on my shoulder and I could just hear him say my name. God bless Brian and help him. God, I don't know what he's going through, but God, I pray you give him strength. Have you ever felt that way? When David was down and almost down, there was an Abishai that stepped in and said, you know what? I'm going to step in. I'm going to aid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help. And that's what the word secure means. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help David. I'm stepping in to aid him and help him. And as you lift your hands all over this place, I dare say there's somebody here that's weak. They've been fighting giants now for a long time. David had been fighting Philistines since he was a kid. And now he's not killing Goliath. He's not victorious today. Now he's weak. And David, who stepped in for all of Israel when he was a boy, now David needs an Abishai to step in and help him. And may I tell you, there's some elders that have fought enemies and giants for a long time. And they've been fighting the devil for years and years and years. And they may need a young Abishai to say, you know what? I'm going to help you worship. I'm going to be with you right now. I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, I'm not gonna let age keep us apart. I'm gonna worship with you. Maybe there's somebody standing close to you and they've been fighting something and you don't know what it is, but you feel like they've been fighting something. You don't have to ask them a bunch of questions. You don't have to be nosy, but you can just step right up to them and say, I'll be an Abishai with you and I'm gonna worship the Lord with you. Come on, can you be led by the Spirit? Can you be led by the Holy Ghost here right now and pray one for another? And, and allow the Spirit of the Lord to move and to strengthen somebody. Come on, somebody here saying, I wish I had somebody that would just pray for me. I wish I had somebody just tell me it's going to be all right. I'm on your side. I'm with you. Be an Abishai for somebody. Be an Abishai for somebody today. Be an Abishai that says, I'll help you. When you're weary, I'll, I'll stand with you. I'll help you. I'll pray with you. You're not by yourself. You're not alone, David. I know you killed giants before, but now you need me, and here I am. I'm with you. Can you do that? Can you minister one to another?
nothing greater than great apostolic preaching. I'm ready for a sequel of that. Amen? Amen. If, you, if, you're, if you're living in this life and you're not fighting, you're not doing something right. If you're not doing everything that you need to do for God and you're not feeling that, that warring inside your soul, the enemy trying to destroy you, you're not doing something right. That's what I'm trying to say. So keep pressing on. If you're fighting, that's a good thing. If you're fighting, you know the enemy's coming against you. Keep fighting. Keep pressing on. We're at a war, and we've got to win. We don't have any other choice. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's come again this evening, ready to worship God at 6 o'clock. We'll have a prayer meeting in the back. 6.30, church. I'm ready to have revival. Amen? Amen. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We thank you again for your many blessings, God. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we go our separate ways. Keep us safe. Keep us coming back, ready to worship, ready to praise you, and ready to have revival in the name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Bring your tithes unto the Lord.